Welcome to Global Evangelistic Center here in Kissimmee, Florida. We are in a powerful time and season in your Bible, Psalm 91, verses 5 to 6. Psalm 91, verses 5 to 6. You will not be afraid of the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. <laughs> Come on, saints of God. Nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of the destruction, sudden death, <laughs> that lays waste at noon. This year has come in with a prophetic bang. <laughs> As of the early part of this new year, the most widespread outbreak of Zika virus in history is ongoing in the Americas. The outbreak began in April 2015 in Brazil and subsequently spread to other countries in South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. This disease has sent World Health Organization, World Health officials scrambling to post international warnings and, and, and travel advisories since as of right now there is no known cure for the disease because no large outbreaks of Zika virus were recorded before 2007. So little is currently known about the complications of this disease. And tomorrow morning, Monday, February 1st, the World Health Organization, who, as they are called, will convene an International Health Regulations Emergency Committee uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, on Zika virus and observed increase in neurological disorders and neonatal malformations. And just, just this month, this organization said that the virus was likely to spread throughout the majority of the Americas by the end of, while the Zika virus is more of a threat to pregnant women, even though it does pose some threat to everyone in triggering other related illnesses, which can break down our immune and central nervous system, there are other even more life-threatening and deadly diseases that do not make it to the regular headlines that we, we have to be mindful of, like the Odisha jaundice outbreak, which refers to an outbreak of mainly hepatitis E and also hepatitis A, and which began in, in the town of Samb Samb Sambapula in Odisha, India. And since 2012 an outbreak of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus, has affected several countries there in the Middle East, costing Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, M-E-R-S. In Madagascar, the ongoing outbreak of bubonic and, and pneumonic plague, uh, Psalm 91, verses 5 to 6. You will not be afraid of the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor of the destruction, sudden death, that lays waste at noon. That's from the Amplified Version of the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Pestilence or plague from the Hebrew translation expresses all sorts of distempers and calamities. The Hebrew word which properly signifies the plague is extended to all epidemical and contagious diseases. The prophets generally connect together the sword, the pestilence, and the famine as three evils which usually accompany each other. The word is most frequently used in the Bible's prophetic books, and it occurs 25 times in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, always associated with the sword 
and famine. Now, in my New Year's message, as we employed Jamatria to look at the Hebrew year 5776, we saw that uh, it was prophetically revealed uh, a double portion season of rest and resting in the Lord was coming to his people. It also revealed, however, a grim picture uh, with regards to it forecasting war and warring for nourishment, which usually comes from famine and pestilence, <laughs> and of the saw in the natural and spiritual. With the sword of God, his word being triumphant, we are also in a prophetic season of time where the former things from the ages past will have a special significance to our present and future. In the spiritual dimension, we will see the revisitation of a prototypical type of Bible prophecy come to fulfillment quickly in the natural. Remember, a prototype is the original model like a sample on which future designs are built. But, but, but when we look at uh, prototypes from a biblical perspective, this whole concept of, uh, of, of the prototype sort of works backwards. Get ready to read for me Numbers chapter 21, verses 6 to 8. This whole sort of concept works backwards because the events, the, and the persons or statements in the Old Testament that prefigure things in the New, as awesome as they may seem in the Old Testament, they are often just a shadow of what was to come in the New. Numbers chapter 21 verses 6 to 8. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Oh, we got to pray for fiery serpents. <laughs> In the preceding verse, we see that the Hebrew people complained against God and said to Moses, did you bring us out of Egypt just to let us die in, in the desert? There's no water out here, and we can't just stand this awful food, which caused God's judgment to fall and for the Lord to send poisonous snakes that bit and killed many of them. You know, the flesh sometimes, I'm sure, says to some leaders, Lord, send them fiery... No, no, no. <laughs> but they were redeemed when Moses obeyed the Lord and all of those who looked at the bronze snake lived, even though they had been bitten by the poisonous snakes. The fiery serpent has been the cause of many a debate with regards to whether or not they were fiery dragons to exactly what kind of snake they were with even some cross-referencing to the prophet Isaiah's scripture of fiery flying serpent in his 14th chapter and 29th verse. The fiery serpent has been the cause of many a debate with other overactive minds wondering if it was a dinosaur or what type of snake it was. Well, quite frankly, when we focus too much on the fiery serpent, we will miss the prototypical prophecy of the Messiah as represented by the bronze snake lifted up on the pole because of how we think about snakes and what was done at Eden. It may be hard for many people, self-included, especially after coming from seeing them snakes up the road, to think of a serpent as being a figurative representation of our precious Messiah. Sister Joyce, get ready to read for me 
John chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. It may be hard to think of a serpent as being a figurative representation of our precious Messiah. But it wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John that honed in on this mm, prophetic prototype. It was the Messiah himself as he explained God's born again spiritual birth, his plan of redemption for mankind to a religious leader named Nicodemus. John chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. If you do not believe the earthly things I told you, how would you believe when I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen. Amen. The serpent was a symbol of sin and judgment. Amen? He was lifted up from the earth and put on a tree, which was a symbol of a curse. Because Galatians 3 and 13 tells us that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Uh, the serpent lifted up and cursed symbolized our blessed redeemer who takes away sin from everyone who would look to him in faith just like the israelites had to look to the up raised symbol in the wilderness it is interesting that the same word used for serpent as described in numbers account of the fiery serpents the, the, the same original hebrew word saraf is also seraph, hmm. majestic beings with six wings, human hands or voices in attendance uh, unto God. Prototypical <laughs> Bible prophecy was a very powerful part of the manifested ministry of Moses, who himself was a prophetic prototype of Christ. He went up on a mountain and he gave the law so did jesus he inaugurated a covenant christ brought in the new covenant he spoke for god truths that were communicated to to them face to face he communicated with jesus face to face he brought about an exodus and by his blood we've been redeemed he came out of Egypt, and Christ came out of Egypt. He was tested in the wilderness, and Christ was led of the Holy Spirit to be tested in the wilderness. <laughs> he gave bread in the wilderness. One of the greatest miracles that the Messiah did was the miracle of multiplication for the over 5,000 people. He performed signs and wonders which did not produce repentance. He was opposed and resisted by the Jews. Christ was rejected by his own. He came to his own and his own knew him not. But such as believe, that's you and me. We are in a prophetic season of time where the former things from ages past will have special significance to our present and future. In the spiritual dimension, we will see the revisitation of a prototypical type of Bible prophecy come to fulfillment with a greater rapidity. I believe that Psalm 91, with special emphasis on verse 5, is an excellent example of this. And because of the timeliness and importance of this message, I believe that Psalm 91 
which I have been studying for several weeks in our Tuesday night Bible study, and John 10 and 10, which we have been studying also on Sunday mornings. We've got sort of an intersection here now. With regards to prophetically understanding terrorism today, I believe that uh, there has been an intersection. But this intersection is a dualistic one. Just like the two-edged sword for this prophetic season, it may be hard to imagine that Moses, who would have lived over 1,500 years before Christ, could prophesy with accuracy to our present day time. But he certainly meets all the criteria to be able to do so. And so too does the particular prophecy that we are discussing. You will not be afraid of the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that stalks in darkness nor of the destruction, sudden death, that lays waste at noon. You see, while we know that God can speak or communicate with us, however or through whoever he chooses, when one is standing in the office of a seer or a prophet, the first question that we must ask ourselves is, is this person a true prophet of God. Many have gone out. Some were called and some just went. <laughs> and some it's easy to prophesy about car, house, and land, and mate. All I got to do is look on your hand and see if you're wearing a, a, a wedding band and, and come and prophesy that. And that's not the Spirit speaking. These prophets of old, they prophesied to regions. They prophesied to territories. They prophesied to things that are still taking place in our day and time. Many people know Moses as the lawgiver. They know him as the leader and as a deliverer. He brought them out of Egypt. But many overlook the fact that he was such an anointed and powerful prophet. Moses wrote many things that foreshadowed the coming of the Messiah. Jesus is indeed, Yeshua, the Passover lamb. All we who have faith in his death and his blood are rescued from the judgment that is to come. Like the manna in the desert. Yeshua is the bread from heaven, satisfying our spiritual hunger and giving us life like the water that sprung from the rock. Yeshua is the living water that satisfies our spiritual thirst. Our scriptures show us that there were other well-respected prophets but there was no other prophet like Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 34, Sister Kira. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 7 to 12. See, we are in a time when the true prophets of God that have been hid in the cleft of the rock, that have not been prostituted by Babylon, will step forward with an anointing to break every yoke. And they will step forth with a fire to speak to leaders and to speak to territories and not afraid and not bribable. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 7 to 12. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. My God. And the Israelites <laughs> wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Hmm. For Moses had laid his hands upon him. Hmm. So the Israelites listened to him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like Moses. Say that again. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> and there arose not a prophet since in Israel like Moses, My whom, God. whom the Lord knew face to face. 
none equal to him in all the signs and wonders mm. which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. And in all the mighty power and all the great and terrible deeds which Moses wrought in the sight of all Israel. My God, there was not another prophet like Moses. Yes, he was a deliverer. Yes, he was a lawgiver. But he was the most awesome prophet from the Old Testament. I don't know why they say old and new. It's one book. <laughs> You see, let me share with you something that uh, might just rattle the cage of tradition that keeps so many of our religious people boxed in. In the book of Revelation chapter 4, uh, there are many deep thinkers that believe that God allowed John to to witness the things that he was allowed to see. <laughs> Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 to 2. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. After this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard like the sound of a war trumpet speaking with me said come up here. And I will show you what must take place after these things. At once I was in special communication with the Spirit. I'm reading the Amplified Version. And behold a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Now the particulars of the coming end time world events are given by John the Revelator in the 8th chapter and played out in the trumpet judgments where he saw hail and fire mixed with blood and hurled to the earth. And the prophet Daniel, likewise, they say time traveled to the final battle in Daniel 11 and 40. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, the king of the north, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. The next verse shows that the battlefield will be in the Middle East. The king of the north will be defeated, and the war will be followed by a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. That is coming, saints. That is coming. The, 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 the concept of time travel is so outside of our regular scope of serious consideration, but not outside of the scope of theoretical physics or quantum mechanics as Jewish Physicist Albert Einstein developed a theory called special relativity that space and time are really aspects of the same thing. Space-time. And that there's a speed limit of 186,000 miles per second for anything that travels through space-time. And light always travels the, the speed limit through empty space. You see, God is independent of time as we know it. As Psalm 90 verse 4, written by Moses, shows us that a thousand years in his sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. With Moses, it was nearly 1,400 years in his future. When he and Elijah appear with Jesus, in a glorified appearance on the mountain, as witnessed by his inner circle of apostles. This happening a week after Jesus had prophesied of end time events that specifically related to him and how he would suffer and how he would be killed, but how he would be raised back up to life again. On Tuesday night, we looked at Psalm 91.5, 
You will not be afraid of the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by day in the exact context that the scripture was written, which in the exact and literal context that it was written, it's basically a reference to the wars that the, that the, the Hebrew children had with several different tribes and people. But we saw from what they had lived, the significance of the arrow meant several threatening things to them. First of all, it was natural battles that appear to be physical and can cause us to be terrorized. Secondly, arrows were used in divination. So evil spells and witchcraft that may have been cast against us. Ah, that, it was symbolic of that. And then it was the symbolic of the arrow of gossip and the people lying on us. Arrows shot from people with a poisonous tongue. But the final thing that I want to focus on from Psalm 91 verse 5 is the terror of night. Papa, get ready to read for me Exodus chapter 12 verses 21 to 24. But the final thing that I want to focus on from Psalm 91 verse 5 is the terror of night. Because this was a horror that the Hebrew people lived through firsthand. One night when Abaddon, the angel of destruction, came to Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 to 20. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Hyssop, due to its properties as an antiseptic, as a, a cough reliever and, and other medical uh, values. Its official name is Hyssopus officinalis. It is commonly used as an aromatic herb and medicinal plant. Hmm. <laughs> There's a message in this. Because God gave us, hear me well, God gave us the natural herbs and medicines for our natural healing. And when you mix the natural with the supernatural, which is the power of the blood to protect us, and to cause the destroying angel to pass over. Pass over. <laughs> Look out! In Leviticus, God commanded his people to use hyssop in the ceremonial cleansing of people and houses. Hyssop is used symbolically in the Bible, not just as a good paintbrush, but as natural knowledge shows us that it was a weed that grew practically anywhere, hyssop represents a faith that can be exercised by anybody. When that which is natural connects with that which is spiritual, when the brush of obedience faithfully applies the word of the Lord. King David cried out, Purge me with hyssop. 
And I shall be clean. Who wash me? And I shall be whiter than snow. The night of the first Passover was the night of the tenth plague. On that fateful night, God told the Israelites to sacrifice a spotless lamb and to mark their doorpost and lintels with its blood. This was a prophetic prototype which finds its completion in the one time perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Revelation chapter 5 verses 11 to 12. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice who worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing oh if i had a prayer focus this morning it would be on those arrows we got to bet to govern our tongue because god wants to move supernaturally and impart some gifts to his people god wants to move with the power of the holy ghost the ruach hakodesh and god wants to impart the power of declaration i shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. There is that speaketh like the piercing of a sword. Proverbs 12 and 18. But the tongue of the wise is health. Saints of God, we've got the power in our mouth to speak and to declare, to speak to sickness. To speak to sickness and to cancel the assignment of the enemy. We've got the power in our mouth and we've got to release. God wants to give us the power of declaration. That bronze serpent, truly, it represents. Uh, our errors we've got to be able to look at what we have done and what has gotten us into the position that we are in we've got to look at that bronze serpent that is symbolic of repentance now is the judgment of this world now shall the prince of this world be cast out and if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. We've got to be willing to get up on the cross. Some things have got to die. Some things have no business being alive. Some things have got to go on the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burdens of my heart rolled away. And then we've got to apply the natural with the supernatural. Hmm. RJ, read my final scripture for me this morning. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 to 12. We've got to be willing to take the natural and put that together with the supernatural. Luke was a physician. God wants to bring the natural together with the supernatural in this new wave because even if you obtain a miracle from god of healing you've got to have the wisdom to maintain what god gives you the natural has got to go with the supernatural 
You got people running around like crazy little pixies all over the place talking about, I apply the blood, I apply the blood. No, apply the blood to your life. And I heard a loud voice there you go. saying in heaven, now mm. is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren and cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame go. by the blood of the lamb mm. and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Let me tell you something. Life is not worth living. Thank you, R.J. Until you found what you would die for. And then live for it. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. I'm not afraid to die. Because I know if they come and they take me out. I'm not going to be lying in any coffin. I'm going to be present with the Lord. We overcome by the word of our testimony. And by the blood. I have chased many demons in my time. I have fought wizards. I have fought witches. And I don't care what theology may have to say about the blood. The only way I know to fight is with the blood. Put that blood over your doorpost of your life. And when you are covered by Christ, no evil shall come nigh your dwelling. And every tongue that rises up against you, you shall condemn. Put the blood over the doorpost of your life. Get ready to fight, saints. God is going to release a supernatural release. But the way that God operates, that's why he gives us a two-edged sword. One side cuts and the other side heals. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Do not be afraid of the enemy. It comes to a point in time where we hear the scriptures of yesterday come back and ask us, who is on the Lord's side? Be bold. Be strong. For the Lord thy God fights with thee. In the matchless name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen.